introduce uh, uh, Rosemary Wren, who is uh, started out as an elementary school teacher. Is that correct? Yes, yes. elementary school teacher by profession. So close, uh, close to my heart. She is a lecture supervisor at uh, Cal Poly um, San Luis Obispo. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn over. Um, Rosemary, I did give you a co-host privileges. So oh, awesome. you should be able to do anything that you want. So cool. thank you, welcome. We're honored to have you here with us today. Well, thank you to everyone for, um, for signing in. And I've just got a little jam board going here to kind of see what your questions are. If, I, if we don't get to them in the main presentation, we'll have some time afterward to have a conversation. Um, oh yes, yeah, someone asked a good question that I've got to figure out myself is how to have these uh, in a dual enrollment space, which is when I'm going to find myself in in a couple of weeks. So uh, that's where we teach college courses at the high school. Uh, so it's uh, it can be interesting for sure. So I'm going to stop sharing this, but the Jamboard, or Jamboard will still be there if you, um, if you would like to continue adding to it. And I'm gonna um, just welcome everyone to this talk and I'm gonna go ahead and get my slides up to share with you. If you'll just bear with me a moment while I get them all ready to go. All right, so we were just doing a little something I like to do with my students uh, at the beginning of class, which is to kind of brainstorm, get everybody warmed up to think about what we're gonna talk about during our session. And so today I'm um, really honored to be here and to join you and to share some of the things that I am very passionate about regarding teacher preparation and faculty development. And I think they go really well together. And I wanna thank Margarita for helping to facilitate this and she'll be behind the scenes um, if I'm not catching something, because for some reason I can't see the chat right now, uh, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. I'm very comfortable in this space. I just finished up a three-year graduate program fully online, so I'm used to, to the mute, unmute, and all of the above. Um, so as Margarita said, I have taught in the K-8 system every grade in the K-8 system. And I currently serve as a university supervisor here at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I also teach uh, children's literature in the liberal studies program. And at Cuesta College, I'm the faculty lead in the elementary education department. Uh, and so I'm just really excited to be here today. I am gonna share with you, like I said, something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, both because of the students that I get to work with right now and because of the research that I've been doing recently. Uh, and I hope that you will bear with me. This is the premiere of this presentation. So um, excuse me if I stumble here or there. Uh, and again, please ask questions along the way if you have them. Uh, so before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that both of the campuses where I work and the home I am coming to you from today are on the unceded lands of the Yakti Tutu, Yakti Alhini, Northern Chumash uh, tribe. And they're the original and importantly, current and future caretakers of the land and culture of the area occupied by both Cuesta and Cal Poly. And like I said, my home. We're in Tilhini, the place of the full moon, and we gratefully acknowledge, respect, and thank the Yak Tichu Tichu Yak Tilhini Northern Chumash Tribe of San Luis Obispo County and region, whose homelands we're all guests. And this is um, this is more than just words for me. And I hope that you will consider. And I know that several of the speakers have have shared. Uh, the importance of this, and, and this goes right along with our culturally sustaining practices and critical conversations. Uh, a whiteness norm, a norm of whiteness is that we're always trying to be perfect and we have a hard time admitting mistakes uh, and, and acknowledging that we are on a space that wasn't ours to start with is an important part 
not just as a performative element, but in really seeking ways that we can partner with the people on whose lands we now live. So I, I take that seriously. And um, I happen to have a friend who's an elder in the local tribe. So I have learned so much from her and I'm so grateful for this space. Uh, this is a, a quote that I'm, I'd like to use to frame the conversation today. Uh, and Dr. Ijoma also brought this up yesterday, how education is a cycle. It's a constant cycle of inquiry, reflection, action, and then reflecting and inquiring on the action that we just took. So I think the hardest thing for me in making the move from elementary to higher education is this idea that you have a course and you plug it in and you teach it every year. And I've never been able to do that because I look at who's in the room and I have to figure out what I'm going to do with who I have there and what their interests are. Uh, and so this is why uh, this quote means a lot to me. We're never done. Education just isn't a checklist. Uh, and, and so I hope that you can uh, reflect on this as you work with your students uh, and your teacher candidates. So basically what I'm hoping that we explore together today are the welcome, which we did. And um, I, I wanted to share with you some resources throughout. I will be posting the link to the, or the whole slideshow along with several other resources in the folder for this presentation. So you're welcome to take screenshots, but all of these slides will be available. And there's a resource page at the end of the slides with all of the citations. Um, so you'll have that. Uh, basically, it's the what, why, and how about critical conversations. And this is my take on it. So it's one person's interpretation based on the reading and my personal lens and the way that I've perceived these. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to give you all some tools and then you are going to be invited to practice talking to one another. I promise it won't be too hard, but I'm gonna give you that opportunity to try a little bit of this out. These are four agreements that come from Singleton's Courageous Conversations. And Dr. Doyle shared a slightly different version of these yesterday. Um, I know it's, I personally know how challenging it can be to stay engaged in a Zoom class. Believe me, I've, I've been in a few where there might have been some side conversations going on on Slack. So um, as much as you have today to commit to this, while you're, especially when you're speaking with, um, your partner in your breakout, please try to stay engaged. I hope that in this space, we can speak our truth, even if it is something that we're not sure of, uh, we need to be able to ask hard questions. And I really wanna hone in on number three here, this experience discomfort. And I'm certain that you're aware of a lot of movement in state legislatures and in my particular situation, in my county in one of the school boards to limit speech that might cause discomfort in our students. Uh, there have been many uh, resolutions and uh, legislation proposed to limit the use of, I refuse to say critical race theory is what they're limiting because that's not really what they're limiting. They're limiting critical pedagogy, critical uh, reflection on facts. Uh, and I find it really interesting that in the resolution that was presented to one of my local school boards, it explicitly indicates that, that we can't cause discomfort in students with the content that we teach. And that would pretty much negate most of history in the US as we've taught it, because at any given time, there is a group of people who is being made to feel uncomfortable because of their race. Um, what's being talked about in a lot of these situations seems to be uh, our white students feeling discomfort. Um, so you might feel a little itchy in these conversations and that means that there's progress and growth happening. And then also to realize that there's not an answer to every question. Uh, so expect that you won't have closure. You might not find the answer 
but you'll be a little further towards finding it. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, and now I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to see it, was um, what comes to mind when you hear critical conversation? So I'm gonna ask you to drop in the chat, uh, go ahead and type in the chat your response to this, but don't hit enter yet. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can see. So the question is what comes to mind when you hear critical conversations, that term? And I'm gonna give everyone a moment to respond, but don't hit enter. All right, and now when I, I'm gonna count down and say, and when I say go, you hit enter. So three, two, one, hit enter. All right, oh, awesome. These are some great things. So we have uh, conversations that are necessary, uncomfortable thinking, necessary, honest and vulnerable, vulnerability, challenging practices for growth. I think that's important to remember that these are, this is how we grow is by, um, by having these challenging conversations, crucial conversations. I am not, I have to check out Carrie Patterson. Okay, cool. Metacognition about our culture, confusion at times. Yeah, all of those things and more. Um, so what, we're, I'm hoping that we can address some of those topics today, and then I'd also welcome your contributions. Um, but yes, uh, they definitely might make us feel uncomfortable. This is the way I've, um, this is my interpretation of critical conversations, and um, they are conversations where we, and, and my, my, talk, my lens is how are we talking about race uh, and privilege and power in the classrooms. So when we're working with our teacher candidates, have, get, uh, getting to this point with them to look at the systems that are going on in their classrooms um, and how they might uh, be able to navigate through them. So critical conversations ask us to question, reflect, and act in order to better understand these social constructs. And we keep talking about race as a social construct, which by the way, until about a year ago, we weren't really talking about race in, unless we were whispering about it, or at least in the circles I was traveling in before that. Um, and we talk about it as a social construct, so people will discount it. Well, it's a social construct with very real implications. And so that's why we have to talk about it. Uh, we, we, Decenter colonial and white ways of knowing in, in critical conversations, meaning that we're willing to take a look at the history and the policies and the processes that we've practiced for hundreds of years in this country that have intentionally left a lot of people out of the conversation and experience. Uh, critical conversations disrupt the status quo of color blindness, which my generation was brought up that it wasn't polite to talk about race, not in the ways that we're talking about it now. Uh, and, and so we would say that we don't see right race, everybody's, everybody's wonderful and beautiful and we're all in this big melting pot. And Mika Pollock uh, coined the term color muteness. So where she's talking about, not only are we saying we don't see it, we just, we're not talking about it and we don't know how to talk about it. And again, that leaves our students out. Um, so, that critical conversations are also going to center on the sources of inequity in our schools and society in general. Uh, you can't look at race in schools without looking at the broader picture of American history. Uh, so why do we have to have these conversations? Um, when I started teaching at Quest to College, I was completely blown away by how invisible my students had been throughout their entire school career. Uh, and not all of them, but so many of them had experienced a situation where they just, they didn't feel seen, they didn't have, um, they didn't have content that reflected their lived experience. They were told, um, people like you don't need to take these college classes because you're not going to go to college. And there were actually people in my graduate cohort who had heard that. Um, so that's one thing is that it's a, we have to be able to talk about these things. And with our future teachers, 
it's imperative. Price Dennis and Celie Ruiz just came out with this awesome conversation um, and it is called Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education. And that's, it's in my um, bibliography at the end of the slides. And they talk about the, how imperative it is for us to develop racial literacy in ourselves and our teacher candidates. And we'll come back to that in a bit because we can't have these conversations with our candidates if we don't know what's going on inside our own heads. In my own research and in uh, a study I was involved in through the uh, real lab at the University of Redlands, we are finding that in-service teachers don't feel equipped to navigate race in the classroom. So we haven't been prepared as students ourselves. So we've got to have these conversations. We've got to break the ice. Uh, not talking about it makes it worse. We just don't have the tools. And I think we've seen the results of that all too clearly uh, over the last few years where there's such divisiveness because people aren't understanding how to relate to other people's lived experiences. Um, and Pace also just came out with a book. Her first name is Judith Pace, just came out with a book called Hard Questions. And her study had to, had to do in some very divisive areas, including Ireland, where she talked with people on literal, I mean, extreme opposites. And we have to be able to develop trust in order to have the conversations. And her point, I love this last comment is, is it right for our children to be learning about these issues from TV, radio, and social media? when the classroom is a, is a good place to have those conversations if we first develop the community and the trust and the relationships that we need to have um, to build community. So that's the why. And I'm, I imagine many of you have other uh, things that you could add to that list, but that's the beginning of my personal list. And here, this um, quote from Singleton, um, it kind of it parallels one by Rudine Sims Bishop, where she talked about how children need to see themselves and they also need to see the way other people experience this world. And so I think that it's really important that not only do we have to have these conversation conversations for our racially minoritized and underrepresented students, but our students who have the privilege and the tradition of privilege and power need to understand there's other ways of knowing and being. Uh, I feel really strongly that, I, I know a lot of people will say how communication is a soft skill. Communication isn't a soft skill, it's an essential skill in order for us to exist, not just within our classrooms, but within our communities um, and, uh, out and abroad. So this is an important skill that we can be practicing with our candidates who can then carry on this tradition into their classrooms. Ah, so sorry. Oops, technical operator error. All right. So again, in, um, in one of her books, Mika Pollock talks about how critical conversations are at the core of everyday anti-racism. Um, that's capitalized because that's the name of her book. And it, they help us to uncover so many of the beliefs and values that we think we know. Uh, and she also talks a lot in her book, School Talk, about how important it is that when we're speaking amongst our colleagues, the way about, we speak about the young people in our charge is really important because those attitudes carry over into the way that we interact with the young people. So understand the ways that we are talking about and with young people. Um, critical conversations help us explore the hard questions about being anti-racist. And I, the emphasis here is mine, is to make these kinds of conversations an expected and ongoing aspect of discourse. We won't see change in our schools, in our classrooms, until we see change in our schools, in our faculty meetings, in our teacher preparation programs. If we take 
these critical conversations outside of the box of, okay, boys and girls, today we're going to sit down and learn about how to have a, a hard conversation. And we begin to weave them into the everyday elements of how we interact with our young people, with our candidates, with our colleagues. It becomes a culture change. And that's um, this last one where, where I'm talking about a shared knowledge base. Again, this is Pollock saying this, a shared knowledge base where we have the ability to have conversations with one another to further interrogate these ideas. Um, you know, there's been a lot said about book clubs and communities of practice. And I think that those are really, those can be a key uh, catalyst and sustaining element of these conversations is to find a community of people who care about this and who are available to talk about it. And I actually have at the end of a little document that if y'all want to share your ideas and contact information, uh, I would invite that to have these um, small group conversations. Singleton again talks about six elements of courageous conversations. Uh, and in relation to race, which these are, and they're guided by having passion, practice, and persistence. Uh, it can be hard to get started on these if you don't have those three elements present. And then as you get going, get personal, keep the spotlight on issues of race if that's what your topic is. Engage multiple perspectives. So I am a white cisgendered woman. I come into this space with a lot of privilege uh, and I there are a lot of things that my colleagues of color experience in ways that I would never know about unless there's space for them to share that with me. So whether it's with your teacher candidate and I saw someone noted on the Jamboard about how do we navigate that if we're white and our candidate is um, I've had several Latina um, teacher candidates, and it takes it takes a moment of stepping back and just creating space. Um, that wait time that we talk about is imperative in these conversations. And if we if if we are a person of privilege, understanding that we might want to take a deep breath before we jump in with what we have to offer, because we want to give the other folks space to contribute. Um, it's imperative that we understand, and I think it's really important as, uh, as supervisors that we understand what's going on with race in this country and in education. And that when we, we see issues related to whiteness, uh, I was in um, an earlier conversation, or I'm, I'm now I'm getting the, no, it was the keynote this morning talking about Cheryl Matthias and Christine Sleater. Those are two different um, scholars who work in teacher preparation who have a lot to say about uh, preparing teacher candidates who are white to navigate spaces where their students are not. So how do we get started on these? And it's just going to be a moment and I'm going to pair you off and you're going to get a little chance to try some of this. Um, we can't facilitate growth in our candidates, our students, if we don't know who we are on our own first. And as a white person, you may or may not have had the opportunity to explore that in your um, as you grew up. Uh, and uh, I would I would venture to say a lot of us hadn't. So before we can really understand folks' different lived experiences, it's important that we interrogate our own. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. Again, our keynote this morning was talking about the I am from poems. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that we can explore our own racial identity uh, that are just like, thinking about it, thinking about our interactions and our experience as a racial being. And if we're white and thought, and we're conditioned to think, well, white's normal, trying to unpack that and trying to look for spots in our development where we had um, access to something that someone else may not have. So before we can really have these conversations with our candidates, we need to at least interrogate our own selves. And then, when we're having conversations with our students, our colleagues, um, 
own, the, you know, accept that and, and express that you're, you're, that I'm, that, that I'm feeling vulnerable. If I, if I want to share with you about my, um, my understanding of my racial identity, I might get into some stuff that's uncomfortable for me, but I'm willing to do that in the name of, um, of making progress towards an, a better understanding in the community. Uh, this, this paper that I cite here by Carpenter and Diem is a really awesome piece that talks about leadership in the context of critical conversations in educational leadership specifically. Um, and they also talk about going first. And this is, I don't know about you, in my classrooms, I don't ask students to do something I'm not willing to do myself including when I was pregnant and running track, running the mile with my PE students at the time, because I had high school girls, no way would they run that thing. And I'm like, look, I'm pregnant, I'm running, y'all can run with me. So I didn't say I ran fast, but I did it. And so again, so just as we would model any other lesson or experience, go first, explain the parts where you stumbled and um, make it more accessible. One of the things that we've been looking at in the um, online education space is how important it is for our students to see us as people first and not some, you know, this educator up on the, what do we call it, sage on the stage. So um, that's another you know, we want to get rid of this banking model of education that Ferry talks about. We're seeing more success in students when they feel that their teachers are human, for lack of a better term. And I think um, there was a session on that earlier today, too, about humanizing. And so if we express to our teacher candidates, gosh, you know, this got messy. I was pretty upset when I figured this out or I'm so embarrassed. Um, if we share those feelings and they're more likely to share them with us. Uh, accepting that we're never gonna find the final answer because there isn't one. Uh, being intentional and intrusive, again, uh, asking hard questions and seeing where they end up. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the ways that I've been able to do this with my teacher candidates is I set up a totally optional like weekly check-in and if you've got more than one student, you can have these small groups kind of make a little cohort where we just check in and have these conversations and ask these questions, either related to something that they're doing in their class or in seminar or with their, um, their coordinating teacher. And then finally, get with other um, university supervisors and have these conversations. See like, What's going on with your, you know, at your school? Because I don't know about where you all are supervising, but I could supervise all the way up to the Monterey County line and into Santa Barbara County um, in the Santa Maria and Orchid school districts. So I have a really long, um, I could be driving pretty far and I have different groups of, of students all over the place. So my teacher candidates might be having very different experiences and all of those can contribute to us getting um, you know more more capable with our with our conversations so I really encourage uh, I encourage you to keep those things in mind so um, while we get ready here I'm gonna um, Margarita is going to put you everyone into pairs and I uh, would like to credit Dr. Allie Michael with this uh, activity. I actually participated in it when she uh, presented at Cuesta College a few years ago, and then it turns out my dissertation advisor and she were in the same cohort uh, when they were in grad school. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is in a breakout room, you will be just with one other person. It's going to be random. And I will put the question in the chat and you're each going to get five minutes to talk in response to the question. And whoever is speaking gets the floor, quote unquote, for the five minutes. And I'll put a, I'll drop a note in the, um, I'll do a little broadcast in the chat or in the breakout rooms to let you know when it's time to switch. And then 
the other person gets to go. And while the one person is speaking, try really hard if you're the listener to just listen. And perhaps uh, if, you, if you need clarification, ask for clarification, but do try really hard to not input your own comments. Um, and, and then when we come back, You'll have, the opportunity, uh, you'll have the opportunity to share out verbally, or we will all do, we can, I'm going to invite everyone to participate in a waterfall there in case, if you don't want to speak out. But I'm going to, um, I just really want to give you all the opportunity. And this is, this is a, an exercise you could do with your students. And then in the um, folder for this talk, I've also listed a bunch of other conversation starters that you might want to try. Maybe they don't relate to you, maybe they do, but just to kind of get you started. So um, five minutes each, and the first speaker is the person whose first name is alphabetically last. As a person growing up at the bottom of the alphabet, I like to give people a chance to switch it up a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to stop my share so that I can put the question in the chat. Nope, that's not it. Let me just grab it. So basically, I want you to be thinking about in what ways did you talk about race in your growing up at home and at school and or at school? Um, and I just... Um, there's no wrong answer. There's no right answer. Your, the right answer is your answer. So, um, thank you for participating. And it's great to see you all join us back again. And just um, wondering if anyone, and this is only if you want to, I, I'm inviting anyone who wants to share any insights or perspectives that they gained about themselves first. Um, please, if it, if you think your partner had something really cool to offer, um, please ask them to share it rather than you sharing for them. Um, that would be a respectful way to handle it. Uh, so is there anybody who, who wants to? I actually really appreciated the format, Rosemary, because a lot of times we get into breakout rooms where we've got six to 10 people or 12 people and you're there for a small amount of time. And so you can't really like jump in. And so like Judy and I, we get in this room and it's just the two of us. And it's like in a, in a matter of 10 minutes, we got to know each other and we yeah. got to have a, a, a deeper understanding of one other perspective as opposed to too much at one time. So mm -hmm. I thought just the format of this was really incredibly effective. And it's interesting because many, many moons ago when I was getting my bachelor's degree, like, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, um, I, had a, I had a sociology class that used this type of conversation as a strategy for the whole semester where you did 30 minute blocks with no interrupting at all. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fascinating, it was difficult to do, but it was just a chance to really get into a different level with people. So to do a breakout with two people in five minutes, um, that was really impactful. And um, my partner had a really fascinating thing to say. I'm hoping if, if she feels comfortable at some point to talk about it today, maybe she will. But um, it really, just the, stre the, the technique of it and, and the setup was perfect. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, again, I don't take credit for it. It was, um, if you can imagine an auditorium full of educators getting ready to start the school year, uh, and this was an invitation that was extended to us. Uh, and she, if you are interested in facilitating these kinds of conversations, uh, Allie's book is really, it's called Raising Race Questions. It's all in the, in, in the slides. Uh, and she did a deep dive with educators, um, basically as a community of practice where she met regularly with them throughout the year and they talked about these kinds of questions. But um, I thanks for raising the issue of the format, Renee, because this is a format that's really doable with our teacher candidates because we have this this time and it can be done in a short period of time either right after a lesson or as you're talking about a reflection and that kind of thing so it's the kind of thing and i like to talk so it's really hard for me to just sit there and and really listen and it just reminds me of the importance of that marianne 
Am I saying your your name right? <laughs> you got it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll I'll second the format. Thought that was lovely, and I just wanted to add to the race conversation. Um, probably my closest friend really shares with me um, about her experiences as a black woman and um, how different her experiences are from mine. And so it's been very healthy for me to learn what it is to have a kindergarten boy going to school and having to have the race conversation for the first time. And it, it, that's been very pow powerful for me to be able to hear from her perspectives. For me, I'm an immigrant. We don't have race in my country. And when I did some research, because I was so curious about this as, as this like a unique phenomena, um, race is very, as you talk about social construct, race, race is a very American construct. Um, there are other countries, it's not to say we're exclusive, but you know, color is certainly um, not exclusive to any one country. Uh, there's plenty of, of uh, color, color based discrimination. But, you know, I would just challenge to think about what that means as we're working, especially with our students who come from all over the world. What does race mean with them and what do those conversations look like for them uh, in, a, in a foreign country um, or a new country? Um, and certainly in my household, unfortunately, it was never spoken about. We spoke about discrimination. My parents did get to experience that as people of color, but we didn't speak about race. Thanks so much, Marianne. And I, I have to echo your experience with your friend who is Black, um, because I have a very close friend who we're, we were raised in the same area. We didn't know each other until we were adults. We were raised in the same area, graduated college at the same time, even members of the same organization nationally. And we, we were sitting next to each other in that auditorium. And we had this conversation. And I was I was blown away. So it's, it is humbling and it is so, it, it absolutely has informed the kinds of conversations and questions that I'll have with my students too. And gives me a, another, just really um, things that I had not experienced that, that they had. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Judy. Hi, I'm uh, Renee's partner. Thanks, Renee. Uh, but I do want to share, uh, I do have a story and it is quite different. And maybe not, it may be more common than I think. But uh, I grew up in a household where race was talked about all the time, simply because my perception of myself was not what I identified with. So I was always perceived as a white woman, just like I'm looking now. I had no idea that's what I was looking like because I was born and raised with an African-American mother and father who birthed me. And so I, that is my history. And going to school, that's a challenge for me because when kids would call me white or hunky or banana or whatever they wanted to call me, Oh, that was fighting time to me. See, those were fighting words because I'm like, who are they talking about? Are they talking about me? They've, they've got to be, no. So my parents had to talk me through this each and every day to let me know my roots, where I came from and my father's family out of all of his siblings, there's one child in each of his uh, sibling, lighter skin, light hair, light eyes. In my family, with my siblings, I'm the lightest person with the lightest eyes. Everyone else goes from that shade to the darkest shade of African-American person. And so I grew up that I had to navigate that. And I heard many things that were racist. And my parents taught us about being anti-racist, whatever direction that went in. And so right to this day, I hear different things and I have to stop and I call people out on it because they make an assumption and they make comments. And um, I, I just never forgot about it. When I grew up in LA Unified and uh, I was in a very diverse school for the most part, but I decided in ninth grade, I wanted to go move with my sister who was in Altadena, California, right? So I moved and I went to a school out there and uh, when they saw what school I came from, and then they're going, oh, 
you're like a number three of something. So whatever that means. So you're supposed to be black. And I said, what difference would that make? You know, I'm here to learn just like everyone else. So I had to let people know, well, when I last checked and my parents shared my birth certificate with me, it actually says Negro. Okay, so we have gone from being, you know, colored people, Negro, African American, Black, but our identification is that when people look at you, they perceive you as one thing, and so they'll have a whole nother conversation when you call them out on it. So that was has been my experience throughout my life. Thank you so much for sharing that, Judy. Uh, I think I'm really glad that you were willing to share that with us because it gives us a it's a good check on ourselves uh, I, to not assume anything j just based on the appearance of a young person in our, you know, whether it's a young person in our classroom or our teacher candidates, uh, especially in this, uh, in this learning space where the light can have everything to do with what you might look like on a screen, but to not assume based on someone's color anything I mean like just to not make that assumption and that's why it's so important to ask our students yes. how do you identify what are your pronouns not what are your preferred pronouns what are they how do you see yourself and um, because we have we have students of all different um, ethnic backgrounds who present in all different shades and um, physical construction of their of their faces and and uh, I've been in a I was in a workshop that I was co facilitating but someone else had the floor and they were saying well yeah I can tell you're white and I'm like you how do you know that you know we don't know that until we have a conversation with people and that's why it's important for us to know who we are and understand the impacts of that before we ask our students to inquire on their own or about their students. And I think, um, yeah, and then we had a recommendation in here for The Vanishing Half, and I have not read that book, but I am assuming, I believe it has to do with color gradations and colorism, and, and that's also a very real thing within, within ethnic groups, within um, people who identify, who may share an identity, but colorism is another element that I know a lot of my students who, again, I've, I've had many Latina students who have expressed, oh, I'm white passing, but my brother is really dark or, you know, all the different internalized racism that goes with that too. So there's, there's a really um, deep well of literature you can go down, but it's important to have these understandings. So Judy, thank you so much for that, for being so generous. We are almost out of time, but Janice has her hands up. So I'm gonna, if that's okay, Margarita, to let, to have Janice share, um, go for it. Yeah. So um, Judy, I sort of empathize with you because um, I'm the side that was, I was born in England. Um, um, my mother was very ill. Um, and so she was gone when I was a tiny, tiny baby, and I was adopted by a midwife, a white lady, who, um, no, fostered, actually, because I had the family, but my parents were not married. And um, uh, then I ended up with a, a blonde sister. We grew up together. She was a baby. I was a baby. We grew up together as sisters. And all we were were Nurse McCall's little girls. And I never, ever saw myself as being a color at all until I was leaving Africa, where I'd been with my first husband, I married a white man, and, um, but I never thought of him like that. I thought of him as ginger haired. It was the hair color that changed that we discuss. So um, we, um, and I was asked by the um, British, the, the American High Commissioner, um, well, he was, if my um, husband had told the, the people we were going, he was going to work for, that his wife was black. And I looked at myself and I said, I am? I've never told, been told that before. <laughs> Nobody's ever referred to the color of my skin before, ever, at least not in my hearing. And so, so that was a big shock to me, one, coming to America. My, I have a son who's very blonde. And when busing came into life, he said, Mom, I was born in Africa. I'm an African. I'm signing up for that so I can get the school I want to go to. <laughs> So we we there's a there's a big game to play, but 
I would rather look at the color of your eyes and the color of your hair and whether it's curly or straight than to look at the color of your skin because that's one thing we can't change. We can go with our hair views though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janice. And um, yes, again, I, I think, yeah, I, I have, I, you're, you're making me reflect, both of, both of your um, experiences really make me reflect on uh, so many things and how important it is to listen to the person uh, and how, what's important to them and then to see them in that way as the way that they wanna share with you. Um, I, we're over time, but I just wanted to appreciate all of you for being willing to participate in that. And I wanted to share just really quickly, um, again, it'll be in the folder with this PowerPoint, but um, just so that you can, I had a little call to action here. Uh, so you can look at the last slide. There's a link here to conversation starters general resources on CRT and critical pedagogy. And then this little Google Doc, which it was not letting me do. Um, I made a little good uh, Google Doc for you if you want to connect, because I'm not social media savvy beyond the basics. And uh, I didn't know how to set up like a little group or something, but this is this little Google Doc that if you want to share your name, contact info, questions, resources, go for it. I, my feelings won't be hurt if you don't use it, <laughs> but just as an offering to you um, as something that y'all can use to reconnect at some point. Um, so I'm sorry we ran to the end and there's not time for questions, but I really appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, would love to continue the conversation. Uh, have have a great rest of your week and thanks for being here and making a difference. And we thank Dr. Wren. Thank you for being here to share this uh, valuable information. Thank you. Well, thank you all and um, hope to see you around soon. <laughs>